<laughs> just like, wait a minute. Okay, and I'm just gonna um, share this on our pages real quick. Mm -hmm. There it is, now it's on the right page. So let me see if it popped up on the phones. Okay, there it is there. Post. Mm. All right, almost done. <clears throat> Okay, and then just one more approval and we are good to go, I think. There it is. All right, greetings everyone. I hope you all are well. Welcome to Natural Read Community Hour of Power. We are so excited to have you. I will introduce our guest in one moment, but first going to just start off with um, just a quick breathing exercise. So find yourself in a comfortable position. Um, feel free to lay down, sit down, but either way, whatever just makes you comfortable and take a breath out and take a breath in and take a breath out and take a breath in. And as you continue to just breathe in that same manner, just inviting you to think of a place that makes you feel happy, that makes you feel safe and completely at ease. Um, I'm at the ocean. Uh, swimming in the ocean with family, friends, loved ones. Um, I am with a, have a whole bunch of food at the beach and looking at dolphins. Um, but just wanna continue to just hold that space and think about love and happiness. And as you breathe out, just imagine anything that is worrying you to go away imagining anything that is stressful to go away. And with every inhale, things that make you happy are breathing in. Um, you're, you're breathing in your confidence. You are breathing in your self-work and your purpose and your goals. And just wanna keep breathing for a couple more seconds. And with that, just continue to be in your happy place, make you smile. And you can open your eyes when you are ready. As you come back to your center. And again, just welcoming everyone to Natural Week Community Hour of Power. Again, we are excited. I am getting ready to introduce our guest. But first, we'll just first like to say thank you to everyone who continues to support the food bank. We have three locations, Spirit of Truth, New Providence, and Family Friendship, all in Los Angeles. And we are just excited to be able to continue to serve and feed the community with good, good food. Um, the fruits and the vegetables are all organic and it's just always fun to see um, the people get excited. Today we had grapes and plums and so all of us were like, oh yeah, plums are great. So um, that is always great. Um, Zoom tutoring still continues uh, through the end of May. So we are very excited to again, continue to serve our students um, and see them improve. Um, I was actually online with a uh, with one of our students today and um, he was talking about math and fractions and, and connecting verbs. I mean, no, uh, con uh, converting 
yards and feet and miles and everything. And I was like, I was like, well, are you ready? He's like, oh, I got it. I said, okay, you got, okay, you got it. And I was like, well, do you have anything else? He's like, I got social studies, talking about the gold rush, California, 1848 and 49. I was like, okay, you got it. So it's just great to um, see their confidence. Other updates, natural we, um, it, get ready. We are bringing our hair show back this summer. It will be a virtual hair show. Some more information on that very, very soon. Um, we're very excited to support RBG Academy this year. So get ready for that. And now with no further ado, we are going to introduce our guest. Dr. Kitty M. Fortner is an assistant professor at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, Go Toros, College of Education, working in the uh, public charter schools. Her doctorate in leadership for social justice from the University of Redlands expanded her understanding and what students need for academic success. Her work with school administrators, teachers, pre-service teachers, school districts, and policymakers is aimed at assisting school leaders to better serve their schools by creating inclusive anti-racist cultures. She believes that leadership plays an imperative role in fostering academic success for all learners. Her research interest is on the intersection of identity and effective school leadership. Her primary focus is on skills, knowledge, behaviors, and dispossessions of dispositions of effective urban school leadership and the role leadership plays in educational systems focused on liberation and justice. She also hosts um, Culturally Authentic Leadership for Liberation in Schools, CALL, a webinar series of conversations between school leaders focused on topics related to the work of disrupting and dismantling the current educational system and promoting movement toward an educational system that is anti-racist. And so with no further, uh, further ado, welcome Kitty Fortner. Thank you so much and introduce yourself in your own way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here and um, I, um, I don't know, um, what should I tell you about myself? Just to, as a way of introduction, I'm not from California and um, I'm from Georgia actually. And uh, I'm, I'm still learning California. I've been here for a while, but I'm still learning California. And uh, for the last five years, I've been working at CSUBH, um, Dominguez Hills um, in the school leadership program. And so I'm learning LA now. So I'm, I'm learning LA. Um, I enjoy California, but I still love Georgia. So. Um, it's been back and I go back and forth often. Um, tonight, I'm not very tired, so you should not hear a whole lot of my accent, but <laughs> if I'm tired, if I'm tired, I might say some things and you'll be like, what is that girl talking about? <laughs> but um, yes, um, I, I work in the school leadership program, um, like, I, like you said in the um, introduction, with school leaders um, really working to create spaces that are liberated, create spaces that are um, anti-racist, create humanizing spaces where um, leaders can lead with love and joy and from a humanizing pedagogy, um, knowing who their students are, who the staff are, who their teachers are, and um, creating this space where, um, where culture is appreciated, where ex, um, education is, um, is excelled for all, all, all that are participating. So, you know, it's, it's the work of my heart. It's not hard work for me. It's heavy work, but it's not hard work. It's work that I enjoy. It's really about having conversations and bringing people into a space where um, we can talk about, sometimes it gets heated, but um, mostly it's talking about how can we make changes to um, a system that um, has traditionally not um, catered to Black people specifically, um, people of color in general, um, has not catered to creating um, wealth and knowledge and expertise for those folks without without a lot of work. Thank you. Well, first, we love Georgia too. So if the accent comes out, the accent comes out. We love where Black, just where Black people are and who Black people are. So it's always great. Um, so how did you get into this work? Like you said, it's not hard, it can be heavy, but how did you get in, into this? Um, I came to California for college and I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I came to college. So my heart is um, really in um, missions work. I came with a, a scholarship through my church um, 
as a Christ follower, I came to a, to a school and, and I was going through the program and I had a choice to make, you know, what, what do I want to do? And I, I've always want, I've thought about missionaries as tent makers. And those are missionaries who are in the field, who are doing the work of, um, for, for, for meeting the needs of the people that they're serving. And so that's how I came to education. I thought, you know, I could be a teacher and I can still serve my purpose in um, shedding light on people and who they are and who God intended them to do, be and the value that they have in Christ, that they have the image of God in them and that they can be all that they want to be. And um, so for me, getting into education was, was um, exciting. I, when I got here, I came to school here in California got my degree um, up in Fresno, actually. <laughs> how, do, how do I get from Georgia to Fresno? I don't know, but I'm um, from Fresno. I came down to Vanguard here in Orange County, um, which, which is where I live um, in Orange County, and got my, um, my teaching credentials. And I taught for um, about five years. And then I went back to get my administrative services credential to become a principal. And I was a principal for around 14 years um, here in Orange County. And then I taught uh, for the University of Redlands, and now I am at um, Dominguez Hills. Yeah, so. Journey. Yes. <laughs> journey. And it sounds like a fun one. It actually was. And, and I, I hate it when people say, oh, well, what do you like best about, you know, what you do? And I'm like, well, when I was a student, I really enjoyed being a student. And uh, when I was a teacher, I loved being a teacher. I loved the kids. I can tell you some great stories of what we did together. And then, oh, but when I was a principal, that was the best because, you know, there was kids and there was teachers and there was other parents. I really loved that. And now I'm a, I'm a professor. I'm like, oh, I really love what I'm doing. <laughs> it's no good. I just love, I just love the, the walk that I've had to get to where that my journey I've enjoyed. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like what I do. I think part of that is because I like people. I appreciate people. I appreciate the differences that you find in people, the minor nuances to um, everything um, being the same. Um, my, my work with liberation in schools has been, I think since I was young, I've always been a very vocal person. Um, I have a lot of folks around me and I enjoy talking. I love talking about anything. Just ask me, if I don't know anything about it, I'll ask questions. If I know something about it, I'll share with you what I know. And so I think that that lifelong learning and wanting to know what people are thinking and why people do the things that they do, I think that's a bit of my curiosity. And um, I, I think because of where I find myself now in the university, in academia, um, working to create, and that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to disrupt and create spaces that are, um, spaces of healing, spaces that are filled with joy and love. I really believe that school education, schooling should be a joyous place. And I know that it's not. I know that it's not because of my experiences in school and my coming through the public education system. And also I, 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 some things that are still being revealed to me a few, a few weeks, maybe a month or two ago, I sit on the academic senate for Cal State Dominguez Hills, and we had a anti-racist training. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they had us do is to read articles about history books, to read articles about history books and how history books were created and how they were, you know, how they get published and all these things and, and, and what history is in those books. And coming from Georgia, you can only imagine <laughs> the history that I was, I was fed when I was young. And so it was a, it was a, a very displaced history and, and history was the hardest subject for me in school. All through, I was a straight A student except for history. When I got into college, I had to have a tutor. That's how bad. Okay. I have my doctorate, but I had to have a tutor for history. <laughs> so I, have no, I have no idea. But um, that tutor that I had for history is a professor now in Texas, but he taught me a different way of looking at history. And I think the reason that I didn't enjoy history before was because the only picture of people that look like me was not a picture that I wanted to accept. It wasn't a picture that I thought was um, resonated with who I was or who I thought people who looked like me were. So it was, it was very um, shaming. And um, I, 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 just, I just always went through life saying, I just don't like history. I hate history. I mean, I made it through college. I, I got through it. I did my, what I needed to do. But I just hated history. I just did not like history. And um, when I, when I uh, went through that course, this is, like I said, a couple months ago, I stopped and I was like, oh, 
That's why I struggled with history. It wasn't history in and of itself. It was the history that was being presented to me. It was a history that I was being fed to be true, to be the only history. And that history, of course, did not include Black folks. The history did not include accomplishments of Black folks. And um, I, I remember when I was a teacher, I taught third grade in Santa Ana, and um, I was one of the few Black people at my school. And um, I, I'll, every February, I had a Black History Month museum. And one of the things that we would do is I would have the students do research on Black um, musicians, um, athletes, um, scientists, doctors, lawyers, and just some of the things that they had did, did throughout. And so we would do that in the first probably two weeks or a week and a half to two weeks of February. And then we created the classroom. We moved everything around and turned it into a museum. And it was a Black History Museum. And we would post in the office where, where other classes could schedule a time to come into our museum. And the students became docents. And the students would share, oh, thank you for coming into the music, um, whatever we called it, the music area. And um, I'd like to introduce you. And they, they, they talk about the musicians. And they talk. Then another one, oh, thank you for coming over to the science area. So here in science, when we talk about Black scientists, we talk about, and then they would go through the different people in the Black science. And so it was just a really, I, I, I love educating. But the kids just thrived in that opportunity. But, you know, I got a lot of feedback, a lot of flack from teachers who were like, oh, well, you shouldn't highlight that person or you shouldn't highlight that person. They did this. I'm like, oh, no, there's these are these accomplishments. These are accomplishments that these people, everybody has a bad day, you know, everybody. And so we would go through that. And, and it was just such a growing, growing time. Um, each year when we had our carnival, our international carnival, I know all my students were Hispanic, <laughs> but we would have an African theme and they would wear African clothes and they would do some, you know, they would do some kind of dance or something, but it was all African and I would be the only one because of nobody else was, was Black. And so I wanted to bring some of that culture and we would use the music and everything and they would just be like, oh, your, your things are so really great. But it was just like, that was the only touch of any kind of Black history that those students were even getting, you know, at the school. And it was um, hard. Mm -hmm. So how did the students respond to it? Like, would you, and would you say this was one of the first ways that you were looking at liberation in education? Yes, I do believe it was. And um, I did the same thing for uh, my Spanish students. I would do something not on such a grand scale, um, but I would do something similar for my Hispanic students in the class and something for my Asian students. So each student got to do something to share out on their culture and they would present. And I think in that moment, they became owners of their education rather than something being, um, they weren't looked at as a blank slate and I'm giving them all that they need, but they were the ones who were crafting and de developing and they became agents um, of their own learning. It's called agentic engagement. So they were engaging in the learning and they were creating the learning for others. That's great. So what, what are ways that you address like, you know, being in a staff meeting or something and you're still getting all of this flack for Black History Month, but you um, know, Black History Month. <laughs> <laughs> it was Black History Month. I just, I, I just, um, I would just tell them that, you know what, it's okay for us to disagree. You don't have to agree with the way that I think or the way that I behave or the way that I do things as long as I'm not doing anything to cause harm mm -hmm. and um, all I'm doing is enlightening and bringing education and it's okay for me not to agree with you as long as you're not causing harm and that was my standard my standard is and when I say harm I mean intentional hurt of someone now harm in the fact that I'm making them have to think through some feelings or things that they have that that is not considered to me harm that's growth so um I was asking them, and I can hear my dogs barking on the outside. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. My dog barks periodically as well. <laughs> it's my neighbor's it's dog. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have, um, I would, I would just address it in, in my same, this cheerful us usual way that I am right here is the way that I do is to address everything, everything that comes across. So I make sure that folks know that, um, sorry about those dogs. No worries. <laughs> Okay, I, I make sure that folks know that my intent is not personal, okay. but that my intent is that we as a society come to a better place for everyone. And that can only happen if we have these critical conversations, if we call out 
and we name things that should not be. And we try to dismantle and disrupt those things. So now, now moving into you've been you principal administrator, mm -hmm. what does this liberation anti-racist work look like on the administrative side? So as a principal, as administrator, um, it really entails a lot about voice and dispositions. And, and you saw in my research, I really look at identity and, and dispositions and behaviors of leaders. And so as a leader, my job was truly to create a space where voices were heard and voices were um, acknowledged and voices were critiqued. It's not just about everybody being able to say what they want to say, but the, it's also about us looking to see, does this fit with our mission? Does this fit with our vision? Does, does this fit with what we say we're doing? Is this what we're really about? Or is this contrary to where we want to be and what we want to do? And so um, as, a, as an administrator, I recall um, at my school, there was all kinds of folks at my school. There was a variety of folks at my school, but I was in Santa Ana, so it was, it was um, an interesting location. And I recall there was a, um, a white uh, teacher at my school. He's a good friend. And he was probably the biggest, he had drank my Kool-Aid when we, we had taught together as, a, as teachers. And he had came over with me when I became an administrator. And he, he had been, um, I was his, um, his um, advisor, his bits of teacher. So when he was going through his induction program, I was his, his mentor. Okay. And so he had really kind of drank and understood this idea that we can't be exclusive, that we have to be inclusive and that we have to acknowledge and recognize the fact that um, education is not just about one group making it, it's really about everyone. And so I, and I, I never really even thought about him in that process until we, um, we had an event and it was for the kids. It was like a field day kind of activity. And we were trying to discuss the kinds of activities that we wanted to have throughout the day for the students. And I don't know what was suggested. I don't even remember what it was. All I remember is that he was so adamant that we can't do that. That's exclusionary. We're excluding the kids who, and then he just started naming and why. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know he had that in him. And he just stood up for those kids. And so a part of this um, idea of creating liberated spaces in school is truly about looking at what the students' needs are and making equitable, e ethical choices for equitable opportunities for those students. And so um, being able to encourage teachers to move to that front and be able to do those things and, and, and speak out where they need to. One thing that is also striking me is even in that inclusion, what does it look like and what is being talked about? It's one thing to say, oh, black people and people of African descent are included in this lesson, but in this lesson, they are, let's focus on dehumanizing them. Mm -hmm. like that, that is not the equitable that is being talked about when talking and, and pushing for equity. Could you just yeah. kind of speak to that? It's true. It's not just um, inclusion. Inclusion is a, a tiny piece. <laughs> when we talk about equity, we really talk about what is it that is needed? Not equality, not everybody getting the same thing, not every, everybody having a seat at the table. It's about creating a brave space. It's, it's about looking at what your needs are or what the students' needs are or what the teacher's needs are, depending on who you're looking at, or what you know, the district or the area, what the needs are of those individuals, and then making decisions that bring them into that conversation, decisions that support the, the work of creating this space. Um, it has to be, um, there has to be a foundation. And for me, I know this is gonna sound bad, but not bad, but it sounds um, kind of trite. But for me, that foundation starts with love. It starts with love and with joy. It starts with me recognizing that I am in a humanized work. My work is not with computers or with robots or with vegetables in the garden. My, my work is with people, with humans. They have minds, they have hearts, they have souls. And um, we have to work. Um, I think Bell Hooks says it beautifully. She says, that we have to educate as if the souls of those we are educating, that we're responsible for the souls of those that we're educating. 
And so we are responsible for those souls. And that for me starts with love. I need to care. I need to start with an ethic of care. I need to care about um, the folks that I'm working with. I need to, to care about the, the, the curriculum that I'm choosing to see that that curriculum is not um, dehumanizing, that that curriculum is not um, limiting that. I'm going to close my door. I'm sorry. No problem. No problem. So mm -hmm. what, do you want to close it now? Or wait? Yeah, I'll close it while you ask the question. Yeah. While you're talking about um, Bell Hooks and all that she said about loving and the souls, one um, piece that is at, that is also coming to mind is um, uh, Asa Hilliard to be an African teacher. And again. Asa Hilliard um to um his work to be an African teacher and one of the things that he talks about in terms of relating to students and understanding the spirit and that we're not just giving information but that we are really impacting their lives is he says that this should that the teacher the African teacher the black teacher should have a belief that our people have a divine purpose and destiny and that there's a belief that human society is a living spiritual part of the cosmos and not alien to it and so when you come from that space and operate in it um understanding john Con hillard again that for the african teacher teaching is a calling a constant journey towards mastery a scientific activity a matter of community membership an aspect of learning community so on and so forth then that love has to come forth if we're yeah. only talking about teaching in the space of capitalism and for a paycheck we're really missing the call and the responsibility that is on teachers teachers are parents their friends their guides their coach their healers their counselors storytellers we gotta come up with stories to make sure that they can get the analogy of what we're trying to teach yes, um, yes. and also building and advocating for the teachers and the space that we're trying that we are intending to create and so I think it's really timely that we're also having this conversation yeah. in the midst of global pandemic COVID has made us look very critically at how we are teaching and yeah. at this educational system and what we expect out of teachers, students, admin, mm -hmm. and even parents if you're looking at the elementary level. Yes. Yeah. Middle yeah. school, high school level. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that um, as teachers, we have a we are in a, a very, very um, opportune moment. Um, but I, I appreciate what you were saying about how we are, are we're caring for the soul, that how we're working. We have to see this as more than just a job. It is a calling. And a part of that comes from the um, from the culture, the culture, the African culture. It comes out of that Black culture, that community, that sense of community, the sense of community with those around us, the sense of community with, um, with nature, with um, life. Um, all of those things come from our heritage. And um, when we teach from that heritage, when we teach from that spirit um, of love and care, then we reach the, 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 the essence of those that we're teaching. I know that I've, I've had teachers come and ask me, um, oh, I have a little black student in my class and they don't do what, you know, they, they, I don't know how to discipline them. I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know how to discipline them. <laughs> what are they doing? You know, uh, what do you mean you need some special tools or special, and, and it really, it really helps me to see that, you know, even though I want to say we have come so far, I, I, I digress and say, you know, we have so far to go. Right, right. I remember one time I was working um, with middle school kids um, after school program with homework and things like that. And when I first started, they're like, here's your class. And I kind of looked at the other my new coworkers, right? And the look that I got, I was like, oh, I have the problem kids. Okay. And you know, all of the all of them look like us, right? They were all black people of African descent. And within about 15 minutes, they were quiet. And the supervisor walked in and she said, how did you do that? I said, well, for one, I don't treat them like they're animals because they're people. Uh, and for two, I told them to sit down. 
<laughs> How hard is that? <laughs> you didn't use the whistle? No, I put that whistle in my purse. <laughs> They're not dogs. Um, and being able to communicate. And I think this is one of the things that when our elders oftentimes say that integration was not always good, it's because at least in the community, you saw a teacher at Sunday school. You saw a teacher mm -hmm. who had no problem just catching your big mama on the porch and being like, hey, so-and-so was messing up and this is what I mm -hmm. did. Right? And it came from a place of love. It came from a place of you will be excellent and mm -hmm. you will be excellent because of white people and what they think about you No, you will be excellent because you are black because you are african because you are god's child and this is what we expect from you and we yes. are going to pull the very best yes. from you. Yes. and being able to think about education in this sense to where there is a place of pride yes. and being willing to know about one's culture and oneself and that's where we sit today. That's why we struggle. I think that's why schools struggle because people don't see those black students in their classroom as, and I'm not, I'm trying not to be um, anywhere political, but as human, they don't treat them with the same uh, level of respect. They don't treat them with the same level of dignity. Um, when, when black kids are acting up and acting out, Obviously, if you have a conversation, ask them what's going on, you're going to find out rather than assuming something and pushing them to the side to, to make it even worse. You know, so those, that space of healing, that, that space of liberation is also a space of healing. When you invite your students in your classroom to participate with you in the learning process, that's something that um, in our college, in our um, school leadership program, something that we try to help our School, because we're, teach, we're teaching people who are wanting to be principals and they're wanting to be directors at schools and assistant principals. And we want them to lead with um, this understanding that people, they're working with people, they're working with humans. They're not working with animals. They're not working with property. They're not working with anything that, um, that is, is a non-negotiable. They're working with people. And these people have hearts, they have thoughts, they have mindsets, they have understandings about the world. And those understandings are not etched right here and right now. They're etched in a past that has long been oppressive, that has long been um, self-serving and denying them opportunity. And so when there's a fight, when a black person puts up a fight and they're looking to, to make something better of themselves, and they continually get beat down by those around them because the majority of people around them are not black, then it creates this space. You know, it creates a space where there's a there's void. And so I think that there's something called family talk. It's like a family talk. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's it's a time where healing takes place through these conversations. And I um, I know that at my school when I was a principal. One of the things that we did was when kids got in trouble, we had a talk. We, they, didn't go, they didn't come to my office to sit and be disciplined. They came to my office and um, it worked two ways. One, it was good for me because I took a walk for the field, you know, rather than sitting in my office. And it worked also to give them time to cool off. So we would take a walk around the field and I would just ask them, so what's going on? What happened? Mm -hmm. what, what can you do next time? What brought that on? Did something happen at home? Did something happen that create? And they have an opportunity to get all these things that are inside of them out and they can speak about those. Kids can tell you what's going on in their lives and you can help them. But if you're not looking to do that, if you're not looking to be that kind of leader, um, then maybe you don't need to be in schools, you know? We have a comment that mm -hmm. says, um, agree, we thrived when we had to, because of segregation, we took integration too far into the realm of assimilation. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good um, nuancing of it. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. also the assimilation speaks to that cultural part in breaking away from our culture that has spoken, that has, yes. that has helped our resilience. Yes. And that will help and is needed for our full liberation and healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I like that. That's a good way to say that. Yeah. And um, too often, I think too often, we, we don't recognize and realize what segregation, um, what um, integration, what happened during um, World War II, um, just, you know, how schools positioned themselves as a hostile place mm -hmm. for Black children. If we can look at history now and just see all the hostility for children going to school and, and where, they, where, they, where they sit in that space. And, and no healing has taken place for that. No one has come back and said, you know what? Yeah, we, we, did, we did this wrong. What's come back is, oh, now we need to, we need to create this, um, a, this uh, um, um, curriculum so that we can get them where they need to be. Like we need to dumb it down a little or we need to give them something over here to the side. But no, that's not what we as, as Black people are asking for either. Um, I'm a big proponent, and, I, and one day I'm hoping to do this, is to open an, an all-Black elementary, all-Black middle school, and an all-Black high school, a charter. And not because I think that um, we need to be separated, no, but because I think that we need to be together. And, and right now, we're so divided and, and so spread out that it's really hard for us to even to, in, in, what is it, um, impart some of those um, community and those um, ideas of, and understandings of what our community can and our culture should look like because it's, it's, it's not in the media. It's, it's not in schools where they're supposed to be learning it. It's not um, in the streets, you know? It, it, it's hard. People are fighting against capitalism. They're fighting against this colonial, colonization, which is really a separatist. separatist. It's, it's really separating us. And so I think that it's important for us to somewhere along the way, find a space where we can come together and we can um, reignite and reset ourselves and stand firm. Yes, and we are going to say that you will open that school, that it will happen. <laughs> Just gonna go ahead and receive that. Um, because when we, when we, when we see that happening, we see the children strive. Um, here at Natural, we, we've talked to um, John A. Gartner, who is the founder of RBG Academy. Mm -hmm. And those kids, those brilliant, beautiful, handsome kids are 15 and under with their own businesses. Mm -hmm. They are 15 and under with stock. Like I have, <laughs> I have never heard of a school that made sure their kids had stock. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've talked to some of the kids and one time one of them came up to me and was like, auntie, this person in another class was trying to talk about Africa like he was all of that and had the information wrong, didn't even know what Kim it was, but was talking about Egypt. And I was just, you know what? <laughs> but the confidence mm -hmm. and- That's the pride you want them to have. Right, and, and, and not being, ashamed to call themselves Black African and to not believe the lies and the misrepresentation mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. has been placed on them. We mm -hmm. see this with um, the school on Slauson. We supported them for the first hair show, mm -hmm. uh, Saunders Garvey. Mm -hmm, no, mm -hmm. Garvey School. Um, we, we see this and, and the need for, and I love how you put that. It's not about being separate, it's about being together. How yeah. oftentimes do we say that we need to have a family conversation yes. and being able to have healing, liberative conversations in a space where we don't have to sugarcoat anything or wonder if it's going to get taken back to those who have colonized and oppressed. I think, so yeah, you will open that school. And you know, Did you hear that? Did you hear that? <laughs> and you know, I, I think that um, a part, I think a big piece of that comes from when I, my, my mom is no longer with me. She's in, she's in heaven. But um, I recall when I was young, when she talked about going to school in Georgia, she went to an all black school and she talked about her teachers and she talked about what it was like. And when, by the time I was in school, of course, it wasn't that way, but um, you don't see those anymore, but you can see, you can school, see school for that's all Asian, or you can see a school that's pretty much mostly Hispanic, you know, you see different things, but there's just no pockets of schools that are just, a, a, and, and I'm, I'm trying to work, we're going to work with um, some um, historically Black colleges and universities 
to get them on board to help us with this project. So it's something that um, has been dear to my heart for a long time. I just think that we can educate our folk and bring back the community that we've lost through, um, through, through, the, through, the, through the way that things have been here in the United States. Um, and can we go back to Africa? No, we're not going back to Africa, but we have to plant ourselves here where we are and we have to make this space our space. Because I don't, I don't know how many Black people really think this is my space, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and there's something about ownership. There's something about understanding that you belong, you know? And I know, I know that we've lost a lot of that. And, and it, it doesn't always come out in our voices because, you know, we, we will have our Black pride and we'll say all these things. But underneath, there's a lot of people that are still feeling like, I'm not really sure where I fit in. You know, I work in, a, in, a, in academia. And you, you, you know, you've been there and, and schools are not predominantly black, <laughs> you know, um, here, in, here in California, we have a lot of um, high, like even Dominguez Hills is a Hispanic serving institution. You know, they have the name for Hispanic serving institution and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But I really think that we need to really focus and, and bring something to our black community that can bring back um, that understanding of what our culture should be um, and can be. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's also good for being able to have that that network in, um, especially using the technology to our advantage, because there are some of us who are going back to Africa. We understand that it may not be everybody. Even Garvey understood that it may not be everybody, yeah. but yeah. being able to have that diasporic, that pan-African mm -hmm. yes. connection in order to really bring us together and have that community and know that everywhere you go, if you're traveling on vacation or if you're moving away to Tanzania, to Barbados, to Brazil, there is a community and yes. there is healing and liberation that's happening. We have a comment that says, as a grandparent, we need to have Saturday classes our school. And I think that's a great way to build, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and go there. And and I'm, I'm laughing at myself because the athlete in me is like, there are games on Saturdays. <laughs> but I, there, I, there's also space for both. Um, mm -hmm. Because we we've always been a strong athletic people anyway, and that has yes, all we have. Yes, we, have. we like to have fun. So maybe maybe <laughs> Saturday is the athletic part of our school. <laughs> and there's it together and going. So absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You have anything else you want to add to this? Um, you know, I I really think that um, as we're talking about this, it gets me excited. It gets me excited that you know this is something that folk would like to be a part of, that they would like to to see happening. Um, I think that as I as I think more and more about how and when and, and, and where, I, I know that resilience and Black excellence, um, Black genius is, has to play a part in it. And I don't, I don't want, again, not the separate idea, but the idea of coming together as a community for healing. I think that's something that this, this kind of school could bring to our community. And like you said, they, they're going to own stock. They're going to know about owning property and buying homes. And you know, they, they, these are things that we would be talking about if they were in, you know, a school with people who th think and look like them, they're, you know, and who, who <clears throat> know how to discipline <laughs> without being the disciplinarian, you know, <laughs> so how to communicate and how to talk um, and how to call students out and call them in to be the best that they can be. Because I think that's one of the things that's missing in school is there's a fear. And I know I many teachers don't wanna say that, but they're afraid. They're afraid of the students to call them into this space of being um, because that's what students need. They need to be called into the space of being where they, they feel loved, they feel cared about. Um, I remember when I changed schools as a principal, I went to a different school and one of the students, well, not one, but several of them came. And I asked this one student, I said, you only had one year left over there. Why did you come over here? She said, because I know that you're going to make this, you're going to allow me to be a part of the school. I get to say what the culture is going to be like. I get to have voice here because that's the way you lead our school. And I really like that. And I think that that's what our students, our children need. They need to have a space where their voice is heard and where their voice is a part of the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to your school. 
That's not an if, it's a win. Thank you. <laughs> and we're just going to go ahead and speak that the people who need to be around you will be around you, that yes. they will uphold you, that they will uplift you, that they will support, and that they will put in the necessary work. So that's not all on you. And that is really, truly a communal effort in every sense of way that holistically approaches our schools. Um, we have another comment that says, I love it. I remember I learned bank banking in the third grade. I had the teachers who came from the South. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to learn. Yes. <laughs> you can That's bring awesome. it home ec and everything. Yes. And really, do you have? Can't you dream it? Can you see it? I can. I can. I can. Yeah. Um, I, okay. And one more thing. This has nothing to do with education, but um, I also want to buy some property somewhere, a big piece of property, and I want to turn it into like a, a black resort. <laughs> Speaking my language, let me tell you, you are want, speaking my, You know we're going to have more conversations after this, right? <laughs> Lee, our executive assistant, if you are watching, thank you for this connection. <laughs> so you're, listen, so speak, we're going to have ocean fronts too. I dream about that. I, I think, I mean, and we could all just go there and just be happy, you know, yeah. just do some things, have some things that maybe you won't go to if you go to a regular resort, you're going to see that. But when you come here, you're going to get it all, you know? So I'm excited about that too. One day. Good food. Good food. <laughs> Girl, you know it ain't going to be healthy, but it'll be good. <laughs> okay, well, good food that's sometimes healthy. Yes. <laughs> and it's, you know, for those of you guys who are watching, there's a few watching. Do you, I, I just hope that you all just, just, look at how just imagining it relaxes us mm -hmm. just look at how just thinking about it and we can visually see it with mm -hmm. our spiritual eye yeah. takes a load off just mm -hmm. takes a burden off yeah. this is this is why kitty does what she does dr fortner does what she does this is why TJ does what she does. This is why Natural We does what Natural We does. And, and Tim and, and Olivia and Juana and, and Benita and everybody who is involved. This is why we do what we do. Because if we couldn't imagine it, it wouldn't be worth it. But we can imagine it. And since we can imagine it and it has been purposed in our spirit, we strive after it, knowing that the promises of God are like the air and they're everywhere. And mm -hmm. God does not fail yeah. and God keeps promises. And so we stand on that. And since yeah. we stand on that with all of the love that we can summon and with all of the thirst for freedom and healing that we can summon, we go after it from faith to faith, from love to love, from strength to strength. Yeah, that's good. From glory to glory, it is true. And um, I, I do believe that love trumps all. And, and I did start out by saying that we want love and joy, you know, to be a part of our work, to be a part of who we are. And when we can dream and we can see those dreams come to fruition, joy follows. Joy is just, it's, it's in the mix of what we're doing. And I know that, um, I think, I believe that God intended us to be people of joy. He intended us to have joyous hearts and to have an abundant life. And without liberation, it's hard because things are heavy. Um, but liberation frees our minds and our hearts, our hands and our feet to do. And it frees us to be, you know, and, and be the, the, the God image that's within us. I do believe that. Absolutely. We are, um, wow, this hour went by really fast. <laughs> um, we are approaching our, our last um 10 minutes. So with our last 10 minutes, those who are watching, thank you for your comments. If you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in. Um, but while that is happening, do you have anything you want to share, want to say, add on to this just fruitful, lovely conversation? Um, I want to challenge people and encourage folks. I want to challenge, challenge folks to look at spaces that they can where they could plant love and joy, okay? I wanna challenge them to always, always 
remember that no matter who it is in front of them, that those people are human and, and that they deserve respect and they deserve, what's the word I should use? They reserve, deserve acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. um, but we live in a space and time now where there are folks who don't deserve, and I, I feel bad by saying that they don't deserve the respect that we give them. We give the respect to the wrong people most many times. And we have to be um, discerning, is the word, discerning of where we place our respect because children are watching us. Our little ones are watching us. They're looking at us. They're wanting to know what the right choices are, are and how to make the right choices. So when we can show respect, um, and, and respect does not mean you're, somebody is right all the time. Sometimes respect means me saying, you know, I really don't appreciate what you're saying or the way that you're saying that because that's dehumanizing for me. That's also respect. So we respect others, but we let them know um, that, that some, some behaviors are not acceptable. I guess that's the best way to say it. My grandmother used to tell me, you have to love everybody, Kitty. You have to love them, but you do not have to like their behavior. And you can speak to that. And I said, and that's what I want to challenge people. Love folks, love people, but challenge their behavior. If they're being, if they're behaving in a way that is not respectful, you can respect them by challenging that behavior and, and helping them to move to a better place also. Because if we don't do this together, we're not going to make it. Right. And that, that love does not mean no accountability. We show grace with the accountability mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the love. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This has just been wonderful. The last couple of comments say, um, love it, community, supporting community. Absolutely. And um, shifting our focus and mindsets. And that is so, so important. We, we shift it. Um, to where it supports us um, and we we do it wholeheartedly. Um, I've been using the word fiercely for a while. So <laughs> we do it fiercely and unapologetically and fully authentically so that we are fully who we are meant to be and who are, we have been called to be. So thank you, thank you so much. This has just been enlightening. It's been joyous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just completely wonderful. Thank we thank you naturally. Thank you, thanks you again, um, everyone. This is Dr. Kidney Kitty Fortner, um, who is an assistant professor at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Uh, we have had a great conversation talking about culture, resilience, education, liberation, and really at the root of this has been love and healing. Um, and we thank you, thank you so much. Um, excuse me, the next National Reed Community Hour of Power is May 13th. We um, have a break next week. Um, great discussion, very encouraging. Thank, yes, thank you so much. Um, Naturally does have a break. We will resume Community Hour of Power on May 13th. Our Associate Director, Tim Bryant, will be interviewing Locke Marie. And following that, we also have Community Hour of Power May 20th and May 27th. Those will be the last three Community Hour of Power until the fall. So you want to tune in, you don't want to miss it. We're going to we have great speakers and also a talent night again virtual hair show coming up stay tuned we have details coming out very very soon soon we will be supporting rbg academy who we have talked who we talked about in this out discussion hour and then also again food bank is continuing please check our page for the schedule and the locations of where you can find food on either monday tuesday thursday saturday or sunday um, you want to pay attention to that calendar as we have many, many dates and locations and Zoom tutoring is still um, going forth through the month of May. So thank you so much for the support of Natural Lee. Again, Dr. Fortner, thank you. We appreciate you. And with that, we hope everyone has a great rest of the evening and remember that we are more than well. Take care. Thank you.